Morning, Sister Sharon. God bless you this morning. God bless you this morning. Come on in the room as we worship our great and mighty King who is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on in the room. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, good morning. God bless you. God bless you, Minister Chandra. Good to see you this morning. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Good to see you this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the room. Good morning. Good morning. God bless you, Sister Stephanie. How y'all doing over there this morning? Bless you. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Come on in the room. Good to see y'all this morning. Good to see you this morning. Yes, sir. She's here. Good morning. She's here. Good morning, Sister Claiborne. God bless you this morning. God bless you this morning. I pray all is well. Bless you. Bless your heart. Good morning, Sister Chelsea. God bless you. Bless you and the family. Pray you guys are doing well this morning. Pray that all is well. Yeah, come on in the room, y'all. Come on in the room. Yeah. How's y'all been, man? How's your week been? Good morning, y'all who are coming in. God bless you. This morning, good to see you. This morning, come on in the room. When you come in the room, why don't you just say good morning to us uh, so we know you're here. We love to engage with you this morning. Come on in the room. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. It's so good to see you. Good morning and saying good morning to you, good morning. April. Good morning, everybody. Yes, sir. God is amazing. Amen. Amen. That's right. I'll speak to one another as well. And if you do me a favor when you come in, if you if you know how, why don't you go ahead and share uh, share our broadcast this morning, so other folks can have an opportunity to engage uh, with us uh, today in our time of worship together. Amen. Good morning, Sister Tucker. God bless you. God bless you. His mercies are brand new every single morning. Amen. 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 Good morning, Brother Leroy. Sister Candy, God bless you this morning. God bless you. Good to see y'all. Come on in the room. Good morning, Alicia. 
God bless you. God bless you. Excited to see you. Good morning, Sister Susan. God bless you. Good to see you. Good morning, Deacon Ethel. God bless you. Welcome to the foyer. Amen. We enjoy these few moments we get to spend together uh, in the morning. Good morning, Deacon Marsha. God bless you. I see you in the room. In the room, we certainly love you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Make sure you greet one another. Do me a favor. If you haven't done it already, go ahead, like, comment, and share. Bishop Vaughn, God bless you, man. God bless you this morning. When we get off, I always pop over and watch you shut it down, man. God bless you. Uh, good to see you this morning. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Bless your hearts. Bless your hearts. Good morning, Evangelist Tanya. God bless you. You, you. Good to see you this morning. Deacon Marsha, I see y'all. I'm trying to keep up with you. Trying to keep up with y'all coming in. God bless you this morning. God bless you. Good morning, Jolanda. I was listening to the replay of uh, the 745 service uh, this morning, man. And Ebony be singing, man. She was so enough singing uh, in that choir this morning. Good morning, Leslie. God bless you. God bless you guys over there. Yeah, good morning. Look at this. Hey. Greet one another as you come in. Amen. Amen. Awesome. If you haven't got if you haven't got the coping closet book yet, you need to make sure you get that. You need that as a part of your library, uh, as a part of your toolkit so you can build your coping closet. Amen. Deacon Ethel says she got her book. Awesome. Amen. Amen. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And Bible says he knows them who trust in him amen tanya god bless you this morning god bless you this morning always good to see you chandra bless you bless you yeah i love it i love seeing us engage one another good morning nick god bless you i was thinking about you uh this more or yesterday i was thinking about you i was thinking about uh taking uh, taking marcus to the track uh when he when he was when he got a, a difficult report card and we was out there running laps i was laughing and thinking about you guys to uh yesterday so it's good to see you. Good to see you this morning. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Love you guys. Go ahead. Do me a favor again. If you haven't done it already, why don't you go ahead and share uh, this broadcast so that other people can see it, whether live or on your timeline later. Uh, we're looking to get our shares up. Uh, so if you haven't done it, why don't you go ahead and click share and invite some other people to engage uh, with our time together. Good morning, Aunt Shelley. God bless you. Good morning, Angel. God bless you. God bless you. Good to see you. Good to see you this morning. Uh, always a, a blessing to be with the people of God on Sunday morning, man. I, I'm always looking forward to these opportunities. Good morning, Sister Lakeisha. God bless you this morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, good morning. Hey, uh, Marcy, I didn't get a personalized good morning. So you go, you give April. A, I need a personalized one, Deacon Marsha. Uh, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Evella, Pierre. Amen. Bless you guys. Good to see you this morning. And uh, the Parks household, we're excited, excited together. I love it. I love it as we engage, we come in together. Uh, I want you guys to know, man, I'm praying for you. Um, thinking of you guys often. Uh, looking forward to what the Lord is doing. Uh, what he has done, celebrating what he has done, and looking forward to uh, what he will do uh, in the days ahead. Amen, amen, amen. Matter of fact, no, I don't need a good morning, Marsha. I'm going to just say good morning to Marcus and good morning to uh, Joel and Joshua. <laughs> no, oh, there you go. All right, we good. We good, Marsh. We good. We good. We good. Yeah, Nick, yeah. So grateful for the opportunities the Lord gives us. Uh, to make investment in the lives of, of, of his people, man. Love you guys much. Yeah, yeah, the, my, my, the park's awesome, man. We love you guys. We certainly do, man, certainly do. Yeah, 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 look at this, look at this, look at this love, man. This just blesses my life every day, every week, man, every opportunity uh, that we get to engage one another. Uh, it is a joy, it is a joy, it is a joy. Uh, certainly is. It certainly is. Yeah, yeah. Look at this love, man. Look at this love. I hope y'all know you guys are loved, man. And uh, and it is good. It is good that we get to gather together. 
Good morning, Chara. Good morning, Chara Bim. Good to see you this morning. Good morning, Sister uh, Sap. God bless you this morning. I see you uh, in the in the foyer this morning. Deacon Mark, God bless you. I see you in the foyer this morning. Man, I'm excited. Uh, it's been a challenging week uh, for for me, man. I had a uh, I had some some technical issues this week, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm looking for you guys to give us grace uh, today. Uh, as we broadcast our service, one of our uh, one of our processors in our computer uh, was going bad, so we had some some minor glitches. But I believe you guys will be uh, will be blessed this morning. So uh, excited about what the Lord is doing! Yeah, look at this love, man. Love you guys, man. Man, I miss y'all. This sometimes when I read these comments, it gets me teary eyed. Uh, but I, I'm grateful for all of you. All of you listen, I want to just by way of a, a, rem, a announcement or reminder next Sunday, August the 2nd, um, we will share the Lord's table, the communion on the first Sunday of August. And we'll do it in the parking lot like we did last month for July. Uh, so after our service next Sunday, we will end our service a little bit before 10 a.m. Uh, as we normally do. Uh, and then I'm going to invite you to meet us in the parking lot of our church uh, for 1045 one hour gathering. We'll do it as a drive in. You'll stay in your car, but we'll share the Lord's table. We'll share in a time of worship together. Some of our uh, Lifehouse worship team is going to lead us in worship. Really excited about that opportunity uh, to do so. I invite you and your families uh, to come uh, next Sunday morning. Uh, that will be after our online service. We'll meet in the parking lot uh, in Willingboro. Um, at the service will start at 1045. Parking lot opens around 10 15 so we invite you to come out and to be a part of that worship experience with us uh socially distanced but together we get to look at each other through our car windows and wave and 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 do do all of our our, our loving hand signals uh, you know and and our i love yous and all of those things so uh, fist bumps in the air, you know, all of those things. So we're looking forward to it. We're excited about it. Uh, but we're going to jump into our time of worship together today. I hope you're prepared. I hope you're the soil of your heart is prepared for the seed of God's word to take root in our lives and produce fruit and fruit that remains. Let's hop in to our worship time today. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Jesus is worthy. We come and invite his presence in this place today. Come on, stand to your feet and help us. Welcome to King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He is worthy, worthy. Come on, put your hands together. everybody we are so grateful to see you this morning super excited to gather one more time of the people of God rallying together around the word of the Lord and I'm excited I waited all week for this moment that we might be able to be together even if virtually I pray you've already been blessed by our time together in the foyer and I invite you to like comment and share this broadcast on your social media so that many people will be impacted by what the Lord is doing in and through our ministry man I'm 
I'm so grateful for all that our eyes are going to see and our ears are going to hear uh, today as we worship the Lord and we rally around his word. And we invite those of you, particularly those of you who are committed to the local fellowship, uh, we invite you to give to the Lord. We believe giving is a part of worship. And so every week when we gather, we say this, we come to worship with something in our head, a knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, something in our heart, faith and belief in his lordship, and something in our hand, a gift to give to the Lord from the incredible bounty that God has blessed us with. And indeed, God has been super, super good to us. And so we invite you to partner with us in kingdom building through your giving. You can do that simply by going to DelvalEast.com. You can give there or you can text Lifehouse NJ to the phone number 77977. You can give securely right through your smart device and we will be greatly uh, honored that you would partner with us in kingdom building. It's time that we move into worship as the Lord would use our worship team to prepare the soil of our hearts for the seed of his word. Let's worship the Lord together.
Praise the Lord, everybody. We are certainly grateful for the grace of God and the opportunity that the Lord has given to us to gather together again, to lift worship to our great and mighty King. Certainly, we are thankful for the gifts that the Lord gave us uh, in the incredible worship leaders who have led us into the presence of the Lord this morning. Uh, this morning, we begin our third lesson uh, in our series of messages entitled Making History. Uh, our lives, his story. And certainly I believe the Lord has met us uh, as we've journeyed through the last two weeks of this series. If you've been blessed, you ought to just type in the comments right now, making history, making history. Certainly we're grateful for what the Lord uh, has been sharing with us. And so this morning, I want to call our attention to a familiar passage uh, in the prophetic book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number 18. And I want to lift just a couple of quick verses uh, into our hearing. Jeremiah chapter number 18, beginning at verse number one, and you'll find these words recorded there. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Verse 5, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you? As this potter, says the Lord, look, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this privileged moment that you've given us, the people of God, to gather around this your word. Lord, I pray now and that you would hide the preacher safely behind the bloodstained cross of Calvary that we might hear from you and not from me. Lord, I've studied, but I need your strength. I've prepared, Father, but I certainly need your power. And so, Lord, I ask you simply to do it again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. This morning, I want to share around the idea or the thought, I'm a work in progress. I am a work in progress progress. I really appreciate uh, Jeremiah's writing. If you've hung around me long, uh, uh, any particular length of time, you've probably heard me talk about my affinity toward the prophet Jeremiah. And I appreciate Jeremiah because Jeremiah uh, demonstrates to us what it looks like to bear the weight of ministry uh, in, and have that intention with your own humanity. And so Jeremiah over and over reveals the human side of ministry. And as I look at the this Americanized view of religion, uh, very often I see it as something that points people to an unrealistic expectation of personal ease as a result of one's commitment to Christ. It is, it is a, a, a faith tradition in, in many ways that seems to celebrate destiny but ignores divine detours. It, it seems to rejoice 
uh, in victory while ignoring the vigorous rigor with which the enemy uses to derail the life of the believer. Uh, uh, you can't and, and get, get out of this life unscathed. And so regardless of what they try to sell you standing behind sacred desk and tell you that you don't have to go through anything, I want you to know the reality is in this life you will have trouble. But you can be of good cheer because the Lord has already overcome the world. But very often we are sold this false idea that our journey to be more and more like Christ is filled with all sunshine and no rain. And just let you know real quickly, if you have all sunshine and no rain, that's what leads to droughts. So, so we need the rain in our life to help us produce to the extent that God wants us to produce. And the reality is much of our maturation, much of our discipleship is galvanized through difficulty, suffering, and brokenness. And we serve a God who not only permits hard things to cross your path, but sometimes he provides them. <laughs> in, in, in other words, some of the storms that we, that we face are not just permitted by God, but some of them God placed in our lives because God has a telos ethic, a, a telos ethic, a telos ethic. Telos is the word we get telescope from. It means God can see way further than you and I can see. God can see that sometimes our present disasters will lead to our future development. Preach, Pastor Chris. In fact, someone said God can't greatly use us until we've been broken deeply. So David would say in Psalm 51 to the Lord after recognizing uh, his own frailty, recognizing the, the sinful depravity of his own heart, David says to the Lord, create in me a, a clean a clean heart. He says, he says, God, I don't want you to fix my heart. I want you to fashion me a new heart. And the reality is Je David was making clear his brokenness before the Lord. And God is well pleased when we come to him, recognizing our own weakness, because the Bible says it this way. It's in our weakness that God's strength is perfected. And Jesus, that, that, he, he's, he's the, the, that kind of king, he's the kind of king that isn't bound to the traditional view of what we deem to be successful. In fact, his strength is made evident in our weakness. He's that kind of king. He's the kind of king that wins by apparently losing. <laughs> he accomplished more victory by what appeared to be his brutal demise. He, he brings us healing through the bruised and broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Lord's method of changing and conforming us is most assuredly not contingent upon our permission, our prerogative, or our desires. In fact, the Lord, hear me, is way more committed to conforming us into the image of his son than you and I even desire to be conformed. And the reality is that's grace. Sometimes God allows the pain in our life to produce maturity in our lives. Sometimes God allows the trouble in your life to drive you to your knees because it's your life, but he's writing the story. Some of us wouldn't pray faithfully if we didn't go through difficult times. We wouldn't even look up if, if he didn't let things crash around us. And that's the grace of God. See, God's grace doesn't simply provide for me personal ease and satisfying comfort. No, sometimes it's God's grace that the relationship ended. And sometimes, even though you had to cry and you had a broken heart, sometimes when you look back over the shoulder of your life, you realize, God, thank you for getting me out of that difficult situation. In life and ministry, everyone uh, isn't supposed to go all the way with you. God often gives vision and not names. And sometimes we start assigning names to people in our life. And God said they were never designed to be with you the whole way. In fact, you ought to be celebrating the fact that God can sift what you can't see. It might have hurt you, but it helps you. When you lost that job, you were devastated and you felt like your world was crashing. But, but look at you now. You got a better job and you wouldn't have even applied for the job if the other job hadn't let you go. Come on, talk to me. 
You see, real discipleship and Christian maturity is this process of growing up through being pruned and progressing uh, through the grooming process. In other words, it's not always easy for the mature believer to rest in the hands of the Lord, but God's expectation, even when the storms are raging, that you trust him to bring you to the other side. So it is in the narrative that we look at this morning where the prophet Jeremiah receives a strange word from the Lord. And Jeremiah's calling was one that was, was carried, it carried both a privilege and a weighty responsibility. As with all of us who are called to any level of ministry, it carries a great privilege, but it's also a heavy weight. And today, more than ever, I serve uh, as, a, as a leader in the Lord's church, I recognize the tension uh, between the privilege and the weighty responsibility. And I, I was talking to Minister Xavier this week about Jeremiah's calling to preach and to declare the word of the Lord. And, and, and he was one who was called to declare a difficult word to people. And because of it, nobody liked to hear Jeremiah coming. I can't imagine being the guy who every time you stand up to preach a message that that ultimately would lead to the redemption of the people that you love. Everybody would turn around and defy you. They would ignore you. They would run the other direction. But God chose this man of undeniable courage to speak to the people of Judah on the Lord's behalf. Watch this. Even though they wouldn't listen because the majority of the messages that Jeremiah would preach uh, all fell on deaf ears because, because he was writing this message that carried uh, reproach with it. He was sharing or preaching messages that people, he was telling people, you got to straighten up and fly right. How many know people don't want to hear you tell them that they got to turn around and repent, that they can't continue to do things their own way? People rather hear people tell them that it's my time, it's my season, I'm going to turn around three times and all my problems are going to go away. I'd rather hear that than to hear somebody tell me you need to stop doing what you like doing. They hated Jeremiah. They hated him because he brought a message of repentance to them over and over again. And because of that, much of Jeremiah's life was spent as a loner. He couldn't have a wife. He didn't have children. He, 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 he was all by himself. And most of that was because he was faithful to preach an unpopular message. Jeremiah was faithful, even though it hurt. Because the Lord called Jeremiah uh, as a child, Jeremiah only knew the voice of the Lord. And so he was faithful to do what God called him to do, even though it was difficult. That's why when God called him in chapter one, he told Jeremiah, don't even look at their faces in theological circles. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he, he would literally be honest with the Lord and say, God, this is a difficult assignment. Jeremiah said in chapter 15 of the book that bears his name, he said, man, what sorrow is mine? My mother, oh, that I would have died at birth. Jeremiah says, I'm hated everywhere I go, and I'm neither a lender who threatens to foreclose or a borrower who refuses to pay, yet they all curse me. Jeremiah said, I haven't done nothing to nobody. All I'm doing is being faithful to the Lord, and every time I tell people about what God is saying, they get mad at me. Jeremiah says in chapter 20, very familiar passage, he says, I quit. He submits his letter of resignation. He told the Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. You overpowered me and you prevailed. He said, I'm ridiculed all day long. Everybody mocks me wherever I speak. I cry loud, proclaiming violence and destruction so that the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. Jeremiah says this in verse nine. But if I say I won't mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is like a fire. In my heart, Jeremiah says, I don't want to do it. But every time I try to quit, it's like fire inside of me. Shut up in my bones and I'm weary of holding it in. The prophecies of Jeremiah give us a unique insight into the mind and the heart of God and his faithful servants. I want to just share a couple of things. Jeremiah is wrestling with this this tension of how to get God's people to recognize that they need to stop rebelling against God. And he shares this message uh, in chapter 18 uh, that kind of falls on the heels of this cycle of rebellion of the people of Judah. It, it kind of reminds me of me because it's it's this cycle that, 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 and many of us, because it's a cycle that the people would serve God 
God would bless them and then they would forget how good God's been and they would go back to their evil ways and God would cause judgment. And then they would cry out to the Lord, tell him he's sorry, and he would relent from his judgment and they would repent and serve God again. And then God would bless them and then they would forget and then they would go back to their evil ways and this thing happened over and over again. Chapter 17 of this book, God is fed up with the people of Judah and God says that their hearts are engraved with sin and God says, I'm bringing judgment on Judah. And in chapter 17, when God says, I'm bringing judgment, the preacher Jeremiah starts praying for the people. And the Lord says, tell the people to honor the Lord, to honor the Sabbath, and to stop being stiff-necked. And if they don't do that, I'm going to bring destruction. That's the backdrop that leads us into chapter 18. I hope you're following with me, uh, because I want to talk to you just for a couple more minutes this morning about this idea of being a work in progress. I wanted to paint that picture because I wanted you to see that Judah was a people who had a knowledge of who the Lord was, but they were more concerned about meeting their own temporal needs. And if I'm honest today, there's a whole lot of us from the pulpit to the door, from the ceiling to the floor, that we have a knowledge of God. We, we understand some truths about God, but every day when we live our life, we tend to live it based on our own preferences or our own desires. We're trying to live our life and failing to realize that we ought to be living out his story. That was the context of, 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 of Jeremiah chapter 17 and chapter 18. When Jeremiah is awakened in chapter 18, the Bible says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said, go down to the potter's house. There, I'll give you my message. Verse three, so Jeremiah went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. I, I want to tell you this morning for a few moments, first thing I want you to see is this passage highlights for us our fractures, our, our fractures. I want you to know when you read this passage in Jeremiah chapter 18, you and I are the pot. You and I are the vessel that's in the hands of the potter. And the first thing that Jeremiah recognizes when he sees the potter at the potter's wheel, he has a pot in his hand, but the pot is marred. The mar means to be damaged or spoiled, uh, to be rendered less than perfect, less than attractive, less than useful, to, to be impaired or broken. The text says that the pot that the potter is working on is a messed up pot, an imperfect pot, a less than attractive pot, a less than useful pot, a damaged or fractured pot. Pot, I stopped by to let you know, first of all, your fractures don't disqualify you from being in his hands. I hope you hear what I'm saying, because some of you might be listening to me this morning and you say, well, PC, you don't know all of the things I've been through. You don't know the bruises. You don't know the 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 the, the impacts, the, the, the cracks and the fractures that life has dealt me. But I'm grateful this morning because the truth be told, all of us that are watching this broadcast this morning, all of us can testify to the fact that we all got some fractures. We've been fractured by disappointment, fractured by letdown, fractured by broken relationships and bad decisions. We found ourselves broken and marred by life. And, and, and a lot of us, we do our best to hide our cracks. <laughs> We try to cover up our hurts and act like it's not there. We, we put all of the makeup on to make it look like we're something that we're not. We apply the correct filter on social media so people don't know that we, they don't know all of the pain that we have endured. But before we can celebrate the providence and the power of the potter, we need to come to grips with the pain and the pity of the pot. We are all fractured. We have all been broken through life. We've all not only been broken based on, watch this, things that have happened to us, but we've been broken based on consequences of things we volunteered for. Come here, y'all. Some of y'all think I'm just talking about the fact that life has dealt blows. Yes, life has dealt us some blows, but some of the fractures, some of the wounds are self-inflicted. 
We've all been born in sin, shapen in iniquity. We've all been formed in this, this, this fallen humanity. And we've all done things, according to Ephesians chapter 2, we've all, we've all done things that dishonored the Lord that contributed to our brokenness. One of the reasons we can't celebrate what God has done and what he's doing in our life is because we don't understand how desperately broken and helpless we are outside of Christ. Jeremiah gets to the potter's house and the first thing he realizes is the pot that's in the hand of the potter don't look all that. Come here. <laughs> The potter could have had some vessel that was already polished up that looked all like it already had its cracks filled in. But no, in the potter's hand was a messed up pot. I want you to know this morning, you if you're in his hands, even if you're messed up, you're in good place. <laughs> You're in a good place if you're in his hands because instead of the potter discarding the broken pot, he picks it up. And I don't know about you. I've told you guys this in many situations and circumstances. I don't got a lot of patience with broken stuff. I don't I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to fix broken stuff. My, my dad and I often laugh because if something breaks, my first instinct is get rid of it. Get something that works. I don't. I don't want to spend no time trying to fix it. I don't want no duct tape. I don't want any of that. I just want to, I want it to work. And, 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 and so when things don't work or when things are broken, to me, they are discardable. But the master potter, thank God for the potter, always sees value even in our brokenness. He's willing to take messed up vessels and remake us to be vessels of honor. Now, not only do we see the fractures of the pot, secondly, we see the fingers of the potter. The text says that the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. And so Jeremiah comes in and the first thing he notices is that the pot is messed up, but it's still in the hands of the potter. It, it matters whose hands you're in. All state insurance tells us you're in good hands with all states, but there is no hands like the hands of the Lord. And that's what Jeremiah receives as he looks uh, through the potter's window and he sees the potter working on something that got messed up, but the potter was willing to reshape it. The key, watch this, to the discipling process of the believer, the key to allowing our lives to make his story is to yield to the hands of the potter. Aren't, aren't you glad to know that you're in the hands of a master potter who is committed to forming us, to reshaping us, not discarding us because of our cracks, but to continue to work on us until we're useful to him. I'm so grateful to be in his hands. Being in his hands is a reason to shout on a Sunday morning. I got some disappointments in my life, but I'm in his hands. I have some doubts from time to time, but I'm in his hands. I've had my heart broken and cried all night long, but I'm in his hands. I've made some mistakes. I've gotten some bumps and bruises along the way, but I'm in his hands. Not only am I positioned in his hands, I realize that my potential changes because I'm in his hands. It, it, the value of a thing uh, has a whole lot to do with whose hands it's in. If I was at Walmart dribbling a basketball, that basketball might be worth 20 bucks. <laughs> but that same basketball in the hands of LeBron James is worth way more. It's, it's, it's in more capable hands. It's in, it's in stronger hands. The, 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 the bass guitar that, that hangs on my wall in my hands is, is not worth much, but in the hands of a great musician, it can, it can hold the bottom of a song together. You ought to tell your family around the house, even though things may not be like I'd like it, I'm glad I'm in his hands. In the midst of a pandemic, I'm in his hands. When, when the economy is going crazy, I'm still in his hands. I'm in his fingers. He's got his hands on me. I'm glad I'm in his hands. That picture of the potter, Working the clay reminds me of the story of creation where God speaks to everything. And but 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 the prize jewel of his creation, he actually kneels down and fashions with his hands and we become a living. So that brings me to the last thing. Not only not only do we see uh, the fractures of the pot and the fingers or the hands of the potter. Lastly, we get to see the finished product. I don't know who, you, who I'm talking to today, but I want you to know you're still a work in, in progress. Look at what it says. It says, verse four, 
Uh, the potty was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. Here it is. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Here's a takeaway this morning, and I'm finished. God has an incredible way of taking what appears to be irrevocably broken and remaking it for his glory. <laughs> Our lives, his story. If you're like me, you've had some days where it felt like everything you planned has, has turned to nothing. Uh, but I'm excited to say, if I'm in the potter's hands, that he has a unique way of shaping it to what seems best to him. I'm, I'm reminded of, of that idea of a God who's willing, watch this, to take what is broken and to make it again for his glory. The Apostle Paul said it in Ephesians that we are his workmanship. I mentioned this last week. That word workmanship means poema in, in the Greek. It's the word poem. It literally means we are the Lord's poem. We are, watch this, the work of his hands. You know, you know that, that, that means that God fashions us. He, he creates and recreates and, and fixes us. And some of you who may be watching today say, man, you don't know all the brokenness I've endured. You don't know the tears I've cried. You don't know the, the pain I've had to go through. You don't know the frustration I felt. You don't know the anxiety that I live with. And you're right, but I want you to know in his hands, he can fashion it back to be something that is useful to him because it, our potential relies on the hands that we're in. And so we can rest in saying, I'm a work in process. I'm not where I ultimately will be. Thank God I'm not what I used to be, but I'm excited about where I am because I'm in his hands and no weapon that's formed against me can prosper because I'm in his hands. No good thing will he withhold from them who walk up right because I'm in his hands. And I want to tell you a little bit about the potter. The potter receives glory when the vessel he fashions is displayed. I hope you heard what I just said. The potter receives the glory when the vessel he fashions is uh, displayed. The artist gets the acclaim for the work. And, and, and likewise, uh, historically, pottery, when it was completed, the potter would put some sort of signia or initial uh, on the pot to to identify it as a work of his hands, his or her hands. And, and I told you all the secrets about my dad last week, but one of the things he also likes to watch is antique road show and folks will come in with pots and vessels from from many years ago and the person will come and be able to identify watch this who was the artist that put it together based on the the information on the pot come here and when if in fact it is put by somebody who is of high acclaim that vessel will be valued greater based on watch this whose name is on it come here i want you to know god says i'm fashioning your life i can deal with your fracture I can put my hands on it. I can fix it and I can produce a finished product and I can sign my name on it. And then when people see it and they say, wow, what an incredible vessel, they'll look at the bottom of it and they'll see my name and I'll get all of the glory because watch this, the potter is out not just for your good, but for his glory. God doesn't need us, but he uses us. <laughs> he allows us to be used by him as a part of his process of restoration. The only question on the floor is, will you submit your clay into the hands of the potter? For without the potter, the mud would simply be mud. But our God is in the transformation business because he can see our fractured pots and yet see potential to bring it into becoming a vessel of honor. God doesn't need gold or silver or a superstar. God simply says, give me your clay. If you give me your clay, I can remake it into a vessel of honor. I can bring, I've shared this before, I can bring treasures out of trash. God says, I can bring jewels out of junk. I can bring glory out of garbage. I can bring riches out of rubbish. I can bring diamonds from de debris. I can bring worship out of waste. God builds his church with misfits, with, with those who seem to be discardable. God says, give me a murderer like Moses and I'll 
show you a liberator. Give me a dreamer like Joseph and I'll show you a co-commander in Egypt. Give me a, a slave like Daniel and I'll show you a prayer warrior. Give me a shepherd boy like David and I'll show you a king. Give me a person like me or you and I can show you a masterpiece. God says, all I need is your clay. God won't give up on you. He won't throw you away. He won't toss you into the, to the scrap heap. He won't dismiss you because of your cracks, because of your past failures. But God says, if you submit your clay to me, I can make you over again. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm finished when I tell you we need to realize and remember that God creates us for his purpose, that our usefulness comes, watch this, from being in his hands. And the master potter knows how to create you to be what he designed for you to be. And what he is crafting for you is far greater than what you can craft for yourself. You see, before the clay is in the master's hands, it's simply a lump. Not good for much of anything. But once God works it, shapes it, it becomes this masterpiece. So, so, so that Jeremiah wasn't confused. This is what the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in verse 5. He says, can I not do with you as this potter does? Like clay in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hands. So as I pray for us, God is yet saying the same thing. I know you've gone through some bumps and bruises. I know this season of pandemic has caused some fractures. It's, it's caused some brokenness. It's revealed some brokenness that was present, that we've been so busy and so distracted we didn't see. But now we see it. And I want you to know, don't give up because it's good news. Even though there are fractures, his fingers are there. And he's willing not only to hold you, but he's willing to fashion you again into a finished product that he sees fit. Because the reality is we live our lives, but we live his story. And if you've never placed saving faith in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you've never asked the Lord to be your Lord, you've never given him your clay, I want you to know no matter where you are on this journey of life, he's yet able to take your clay to put it on the potter's wheel, to, to be able to, to mend the broken places. He yet is the repairer of the breach. He can fill in the cracks and he can fashion you anew. He can make you what you could never imagine. You could be, but you got to yield your clay to him. You've got to acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a savior. You got to admit that you need the Lord. Believe that he died, was buried, and rose again on the third day with power. And confess with your mouth that he is Lord to the glory of God. On the authority of the word of the Lord, if you would do that, he will welcome you into his forever family. He'll put you on his potter's wheel. As, as the old song said, the potter wants to put you back together. Again, if you made the decision for the Lord today, I'd love to pray for you. If you want, you can type, I've decided right here uh, on the pages uh, of this live broadcast. You can type, I've decided. We'll reach out to you. Or you can shoot us an email to east at rightwhereyouare.com. We'd love to pray for you. We're believing God for you. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this, your word. Thank you for these, your people. Thank you, Lord, that we're all a work in progress, Lord, that we are, we are in process on the potter's wheel. Lord God, that we may be fractured, but we're in your hands. And because we're in your hands, we ultimately can become what you've called us to be. So, Lord, help us to, to yield to your hands and that you might fashion us to be all that you've called us to be. That's our prayer today. In Jesus' name we pray. Help us to live our lives, but help us to live your story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you today. As we leave, we're going to worship our Lord, our great and mighty King, who alone is worthy to be praised. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you soon. Through.